the uh, Grant Street's wide open, but boy, the uh, line of march through the downtown area is just packed with people right now. What a big party shaping up down there. You should see Gateway Center with the yellow balloons and the sign, Go Terry Go! Defense, defense, we're number one. A lot of excitement, you can see it on the face of the city from up here. You know, it's just about the ex most exciting thing I've seen since the parting of the Red Sea, Dave. What's going down on the ground? We've got a nice crowd in this area. There's a crowd gathering, as Mike was telling you, from up above, and he's missing all the fun, because all the fun is down here. If I can get to my band, we'd like to have him play a little song for all the people in the Pittsburgh area. Just a, just a quickie to give you an idea of the fun crowd, the family-type crowd that's in downtown Pittsburgh right now. Here's Jack Purcell and his boys. The Pittsburgh Steelers were considered certain Super Bowl contenders at the start of 1974, despite the fact that two new faces appeared in the starting lineup. Of all places, they were at quarterback, where three-year pro Joe Gillum would start, and at middle linebacker, where a rookie, Jack Lambert, number 58, treaded water for a while, got his feet wet, and then came on with a splash. With Lambert in the middle, the Steeler defense rose up in a mighty goal line stand that keyed their shutout of the Colts. Rock rib defense was nothing new for Pittsburgh fans, but Jefferson Street Joe Gillum was, and he was magnificent, leading the Steeler offense to 30 points. Two first-year wide receivers, John Stallworth, number 82, and Lynn Swan, number 88, also had splendid debuts. In all, 14 rookies made the Steeler roster, and mixed with young veterans like Frank Lewis, number 43, the Steelers were young, but they were tough. In Denver, Gillum's buggy whip right arm accounted for 31 completions and 348 yards, including a spectacular screen to Steve Davis as the high-powered Steeler offense rolled to 35 more points. But Pittsburgh also gave up 35 points and the Steelers settled for an unsatisfying tie. Then, after scoring 65 points in their first two games, the Steeler offense disappeared. The Oakland Raider defense was the magician, and the Steelers lost 17 to nothing. Pittsburgh's progress was a patchwork. One devastating win, one disappointing tie, and one depressing defeat. Such inconsistency would gnaw at the superstructure of the Steelers and threaten to ruin their season. Against the Houston Oilers, the Steelers scored just 13 points and actually trailed seven to six in the fourth quarter. The Oilers enjoyed their touchdown immensely, but it was the only one they got as the Pittsburgh defense paved the road to a 13-7 Steeler victory. Facing the Chiefs the next week, the defense claimed nine turnovers and put points on the board on Glenn Edwards' 50-yard interception return as defense keyed another Steeler victory. Though Chuck Knoll was concerned over his sleeping giant offense, one thing that never let him down was the magnificent Steel Curtain defense. The strength of the Steeler defense is the front four. Number 68, L.C. Greenwood. Number 75, Joe Green. Number 63, Ernie Holmes. And number 78, 
Dwight White. Mad Dog, Mean Joe, Fats, Hollywood Bags. Arrowhead Ernie pointed the way to the past pocket, and no matter what you call them or in what order you name them, the Steeler front four just kept coming. By the end of the regular season, 52 pass pockets had been pillaged. Chief beneficiary of the brutal Pittsburgh pass rush was the secondary. Steeler most valuable player safety, Glenn Edwards. Cornerbacks, Mel Blunt, number 47. And J.T. Thomas, number 24. And safety, Mike Wagner, number 23. The Steeler front four was equally brilliant against the rush and freed of much run responsibility the stickers in the secondary were left looking for someone with his head down or drooling for the ball. By the end of the regular season, 25 enemy passes had been pirated. Outside linebackers Andy Russell, number 34, and Jack Ham were different yet similar. Russell is one of the leading proponents of the Blitz and no linebacker intercepted more passes than number 59, Jack Ham, in 1974. But one thing no one ever did was break outside of either man. Before the season, middle linebackers seemed to be the only question mark. But rookie Jack Lambert from Kent State turned question mark into exclamation point. Joe Green put it rather well when he said, Jack Lambert is so mean, he doesn't even like himself. Jack Lambert, the third Steeler named Rookie of the Year in the past six seasons, is emblematic of Pittsburgh's rise. 34 current Steelers are original Pittsburgh draft choices, and several rookies made it big this season, including Lambert and wide receivers Lynn Swan, the number one pick from USC, and John Stallworth, chosen in round four from Alabama A&M. In addition to his talent as a receiver, the graceful Lynn Swan, number 88, compiled the second greatest punt return yardage performance in the history of pro football. Swan's performance was a tribute to Steelers' special teams. 
Roy Girella, who led the American Conference in scoring for the second straight season, and 11-year veteran and oldest dealer at 36, Bobby Walden, put the ball in play and everyone else bombed after it. There was never any question that defense and special teams would go a long way in making the Steelers number one. The Pittsburgh offense was in a period of transition. On the season's sixth Sunday, the Steelers beat the Browns 20 to 16. But the magic had gone out of their aerial circus, and it was becoming increasingly clear that the Steelers would have to run for their playoff lives. Much of the challenge fell on the broad shoulders of Franco Harris, who due to a series of nicks and bruises, had rushed for just 206 yards in the season's first six games. The challenge touched Rocky Blyer, the Steelers' best blocking running back who became a starter. But most of all, the challenge called on Terry Bradshaw. If the Steelers were to run to a title, who better to step behind center than the strongest running quarterback in the league? But the challenge went deeper for Terry Bradshaw. He took to reading his Bible again, and the competition for the quarterback job would add to his growth as a man capable of controlling an offense. The battle lines were drawn, the foot soldiers of the offensive line ready when the Steelers faced the Atlanta Falcons. Rocky Blyer proved to be more than just a blocker, and Franco Harris rushed for over 100 yards for the first time in 1974, beginning a streak that would see him gain exactly 800 yards in the season's last eight games. The next week against the Eagles, Bradshaw's confident cool under a heavy rush breathed life back into the passing game as the Steelers rolled up 27 points. The Eagles got no points and were outscored when Mel Blunt returned an interception for a score. With a crushing 27-0 victory and a 6-1-1 record, the Steelers at last appear to have everything together. But the sword of inconsistency still hung over them. With a chance to put away their closest pursuers for good, the Steelers failed four times from the 20-yard line late in the game and lost 17 to 10 to the Bengals. After two convincing wins, an inconsistent performance by the Pittsburgh offense again cast a shadow of doubt on the Steelers' season and led to another change. Against Cleveland, Terry Hanratty stepped into the breach and started strongly with a strike to Ron Shanklin. But Hanratty would complete just two passes in the game and the 74 Steelers success formula was called on again. Running, not passing, and hard rock defense led to the Steelers' first victory in Cleveland since 1964. When the Steelers met the Saints, two more changes were made. Steve Furness, number 64, 
filled in for the injured Ernie Holmes on defense. On offense, Terry Bradshaw was back as Pittsburgh punished New Orleans 28-7. With another brace of impressive wins, the Steelers again seem to be gathering momentum. But then the bugaboo of inconsistency flew up and bit them again. Playing in a blizzard, the Steelers managed just 10 points and lost to the Oilers. This was the blackest loss of all, for it kept the Bengals alive as the Steelers traveled to Foxborough for a tough game against the Patriots. For Terry Bradshaw, the game was the turning point in his career. Unlike earlier in the season, when Chuck Knoll had replaced him after a loss, Knoll now stuck with Bradshaw. And in a game where the offense simply had to get it done, they did. The Steelers were champions of the AFC Central Division, but their crowning as division titleists was greeted as much with a sigh of relief as with a joyous shout. For the end to an on-again, off-again regular season was behind them, and a new one was just beginning. Experts figured the defense would carry the Steelers. Pittsburgh fans had used more sophisticated devices to plot the Steelers' future. We figured out scientifically, without any prejudice, who's going to win the ball game. The Steelers are going to win because they're hungry. They didn't have no breakfast today. They've been waiting for the juice! <laughs> <laughs> O.J. Simpson got just 49 yards rushing, more than what the Steelers' next two foes would amass combined. But defense did not win this game for the Steelers. The awakening Steeler offense won this one. The Pittsburgh attack took wing as Terry Bradshaw generaled his forces to over 400 yards and 32 points. Franco Harris's three touchdowns, the Steeler offense blew away the bill. Just when you get around, just slow down so I can hit you like a hook. Okay. And we got all kind of running room. Yeah.
control of the AFC Championship game against the arch enemy Oakland Raiders centered on a supposedly neutral strip of turf. But it was not neutral on this day. On offense, Ray Mansfield, Sam Davis, Jim Clack, Gordon Gravel, Jerry Mullins, John Cole, and Larry Brown simply owned it. 47 times Franco Harris and Rocky Blyer barged through giant cracks in the Raider defense for over 200 yards. Franco Harris cracked the end zone twice more, and with Terry Bradshaw throwing short and long, plain and fancy, and always straight, the Steelers moved in for the kill. Steel Curtain was no less brilliant in their domination of the scrimmage line, limiting Raider runners to just 29 yards and rattling Snake Stabler into three interceptions. With an awesome display of offensive and defensive football, the Steelers earned their first ever conference championship. And the prophets from Pittsburgh who had predicted Super Bowl Steelers had proved prophetic indeed. Pittsburgh's going to the Super Bowl! We got a feeling! Pittsburgh's going to the Super Bowl! We got a feeling! Pittsburgh's going to the Super Bowl! Again in Super Bowl IX, the Steelers were simply awesome. Despite the fact that Dwight White literally stepped out of the hospital and onto the field, and injuries to Andy Russell and Jack Lambert later in the game, Lauren Taves and Ed Bradley, number 38, stepped in smartly, and the Steel Curtain gave up just 17 yards rushing and 123 yards total offense. Both Super Bowl records. Fittingly, in a half dominated by defense, the only score was a safety. And with a 2-0 lead, the Steelers got a break on the second half kickoff. Super Bowl most valuable player and record-setting runner Franco Harris used two runs to turn the turnover into a 9-0 lead. Though Pittsburgh had dominated, a blocked punt left them with a precarious lead with 10 minutes to go. But the Steelers had waited 42 years for this game, and Terry Bradshaw summoned the Steeler offense to a blood and guts victory drive.
their third straight total destruction of championship caliber competition. And in their 43rd year of existence, the Steelers laid waste to the tired tag, same old Steelers. A new one now applies, the Super Steelers, victors in Super Bowl IX, champions of the National Football League. The Pittsburgh Steelers Football Club was founded by Arthur J. Rooney in 1933. Rooney's early Steelers were a hardy band of pioneers who lured curious fans into old Forbes Field to watch Jock Sutherland's wide open single wing. The names were Bullet Bill Dudley, Johnny Blood and Byron Wizzer White. And while they never won a title, they did introduce Pittsburgh to NFL excitement. In the 50s, the scene shifted to Pitt Stadium. The names changed to Stautner, Hope, Butler, and Shadnoy. But for all their promise, the Steelers were never quite cut of championship timber. In 1969, an unknown young coach named Chuck Knoll arrived to try his hand where 11 others had failed. Knoll worked no sudden miracles. His first Steeler team was 1-13, and, and at one point, the losing streak reached 16 straight. But Noel was patiently laying a foundation for future greatness. Pittsburgh coaches and scouts were constructing a champion in the NFL draft. Pittsburgh, on the first round, selects Lynn Swan, wide receiver, Southern California. In six seasons of judicious drafting, Pittsburgh went from 1-13 and 13 to a silver Super Bowl salute for the man who started it all. This is the story of the building of a team. Executives, scouts, coaches, and players rising together to a world championship, then defending that title. This is the story of the Pittsburgh Steeler blueprint for victory. Any blueprint needs a cornerstone, and Chuck Knoll's first concern was a solid defense. The lineup that opened the 1975 season was testament to the worth of the master plan. During the building years, nine draft choices and one free agent had arrived to form pro football's most feared and ferocious defense. Greatness begins in the raw power of the front lines. Four young men from tiny southern colleges have delivered the title Steel Curtain into legend. The quiet one with golden shoes is six feet six inch L.C. Greenwood a 10th round choice from Arkansas AM and N. Greenwood is a lean and limber all pro, using nimbleness to weave his web. Ernie Fats Holmes is Greenwood's stocky opposite, a stern and sturdy heavy who anchors scrimmage like a cement post. Holmes arrived in the 71 draft from Texas Southern and brought with him another Steeler trademark, intimidation. The youngest member is Dwight White, a cocky kid from East Texas State with a mischievous grin. But the smile fades when White prepares a full speed assault on an opponent's backfield. White's game is aggression and agility, as often finesse gives way to youthful exuberance.
After the game, fun-loving Dwight White regains his winning smile, but everyone knows the one they call Mean Joe is a killer. Actually, Joe Green is a happy, friendly fellow who arrived on the first round in 1969 from North Texas State. Green became a five-time All-Pro and emotional leader of his team. But 1975 was not kind. Injuries benched Green for the first time in his career. Yet his misfortune proved that Pittsburgh had also drafted for depth. Steve Furness stepped in and the defense never missed a beat. It is a measure of the man that injury did not dampen his spirit. Green's infectious enthusiasm continued to lead and inspire as the steel curtain held strong with resident all pros and newcomer Steve Furness. A big rush needs solid support, and Penn State's Jack Ham arrived on the second round in 71 to take away the screen. Opponents tried to counter pressure with short tosses, but Ham is an exceptional athlete with playbook perfect technique. Opposite Ham is the grand old man of the Steeler defense. Back in 63, Pittsburgh invested a 16th round draft choice in a feisty little outside backer from Missouri named Andy Russell. 12 years later, number 34 still blitzes with the best. While Russell is the only Steeler defender over 30, his experienced style is matched by 23-year-old Jack Lambert. Lambert arrived in 74 as a surprise second round choice from Kent State. The beanpole middle backer needed some beefing up, but Lambert started at middle linebacker in his first pro game and has been there ever since. Rookie of the year in 74, all pro in 75. But the toughest dudes of all might be in the secondary. Steeler backs hit and leading the pack is free safety Glenn Edwards, number 27. Actually, enemy receivers pay a double price. Cornerback J.T. Thomas can deliver a lick or get back in the passing lanes and pick an opponent clean. Strong safety Mike Wagner is also a clever ball hawk. The fact is, Every Pittsburgh defensive back can go get the ball, including reserves like Jimmy Allen. But 1975's brightest star was a quarter horse rancher from Slidell, Louisiana, named Mel Blunt. A starter since arriving in the 70 draft, Blunt became the first dealer since Bullet Bill Dudley to lead the league in interceptions. For his end zone heroics, Blunt's teammates named him most valuable. But this is one defense where no single individual supports the rest. Eleven angry men, each of all-star quality, yet willing to blend into the whole. The men in black an ominous, intimidating force that will be judged with history's best. Thank you. 
On every football team, even a world champion, there are the shadow men. These are the members of the special teams, reserves who set out to prove themselves in the crash and tumble of kick coverage. Take your lumps, but get back in the chase, like number 31, Donnie Shell. For free agent Shell, a first round draft choice, Dave Brown, number 36, it is a chance to display skills that may one day lead to a starting role. An opportunity to contribute for linebackers Ed Bradley, Lauren Taves, and Marv Kellum, defensive linemen John Banaszak, running backs Mike Collier and Reggie Harrison, and wide receiver Reggie Garrett. Another group of shadow men controls the destiny of Pittsburgh's offense. The Steeler offensive line with Jerry Mullins and Gordon Gravel, Jim Clack and John Cole, and at center, veteran Ray Mansfield. Some switch positions each quarter. Others, like Sam Davis and Mike Webster, shuttle in to split time with starters. Here, versatility is the key. The result is a rotating seven-man front which opens the holes that made Franco famous. In 1972, Pittsburgh scouts and coaches decided to spend their first round pick on a running back from Penn State named Franco Harris. They envisioned the power of a big back, blended with the open field agility of a smaller man. From Rookie of the Year to Superstar, Harris has not disappointed. During 1975, Franco was at his best in the big games as Pittsburgh won a division title by sweeping all six games in the strong AFC Central. Along the way, number 32 set all-time Pittsburgh rushing records. But modest Franco prefers to mention the courage of his running mate, Rocky Blyer. Originally a 16th round pick in 68, Blyer miraculously recovered from Vietnam shrapnel wounds to finally make the squad in 72. At first, number 20's main role was designated blocker for Franco Harris. By 74, they couldn't keep him out of the starting lineup with a style that was all guts and grinded out. In 1975, in a game against the Green Bay Packers, Blyer gained 163 yards and all year demonstrated how far heart and determination can take a man. A little 16th round draft choice and a big first round pick have both found a place in the Pittsburgh blueprint. In 1970, a wild and woolly Louisiana Tech quarterback impressed scouts with unpolished skills and a rocket right arm. Terry Bradshaw arrived in Pittsburgh full of starry-eyed rookie intentions. This is the new era of the Steelers. It's not like the old Steelers, believe me. The public, uh, the football world might as well wake up and, and just take what I'm saying to, and heed it because and as the games come along, as the year progresses, I hope to continually get better and, uh, and in the future I hope to be the greatest quarterback that's ever stepped foot on this stadium or any other stadium. But in five NFL seasons, number 12 has experienced some ups and downs. NFL reality taught harsh lessons and Terry Bradshaw lost some hair, but all that raw talent remained intact. And Chuck Knoll has been patient. For number 12 is still capable of unique feats of strength and daring. Bradshaw can turn near disaster into a 20-yard game. But he also has discovered there are times to feather his touch 
as well as times to reach back for that 60-yard screamer. Because of his arm, Bradshaw takes the deepest drop and longest look in football. If he doesn't like what he sees, there's always another option. At 27, Terry Bradshaw is Pittsburgh's all-time leading passer. He's won a world championship and cut a country and western record. But deep down, he's not too far removed from that wild and woolly Louisiana Tech quarterback playing football for the fun of it. Terry Bradshaw will never be called dull, but 1975 brought more consistency. He threw only nine interceptions against 18 touchdown passes to a variety of receivers. With tight ends Larry Brown and Randy Grossman, Bradshaw can work the short game, then go down range to a deep stable of wide receivers. Frank Lewis is a former starter who now splits time because of the success of the 74 draft. Two young receivers arrived and contributed immediately. The sleeper was number 82, John Stallworth from Alabama A&M. Stallworth's first round friend was a hot shot from USC with a reputation as California's finest all-around athlete. Number 88, Lynn Swan, lived up to his billy. Often gifted young receivers arrive in the NFL unprepared for the jolt of going over the middle. But Swan was a pro from his first day, willing to go anywhere for a pass. Soon, Pittsburgh fans were singing praises of the young man with a stride and style as graceful as his name. The emerging star became part of an unusual equation. Terry Bradshaw and Lynn Swan made it work 11 times in 75. Unstoppable offense matched immovable defense as the 1975 Steelers won more games, scored more points, and gave up fewer than any team in Pittsburgh history. Next, the NFL playoffs. On a steel gray December day, the second season began. Playoff time brought the sky-high Baltimore Colts to Three Rivers, but their storybook season was about to be spoiled by a brutally basic Pittsburgh ground attack. Franco Harris gained one yard less than the entire Baltimore offense. Then the men in black put it away for good. Fittingly, an elder statesman accepted the honors. Andy Russell set a playoff record for elapsed time during a 97-yard touchdown run. Pittsburgh eased home with a win, but a stiffer challenge was yet to come. In an icy AFC championship, Pittsburgh faced arch-rival Oakland, a playoff opponent for the fourth consecutive year. The chill factor was sub-zero, but Steeler fans persevered. A sea of black and gold had come to pay homage to the conquering hero. Let's go, Steelers! Come on! All right, all right! Let's go! All right,
to hit it hard and you just make sure you get outside because I'm coming, I'm hitting that, I'm hitting it like a bitch. The bitter battle began to take its toll on both sides. Then, through a gathering storm, the game turned on two fourth quarter plays. Classic struggle, the Steelers have endured for a 16-10 victory. On to sunny Super Bowl X against the Dallas Cowboys. When holder Bobby Walden and kicker Roy Jarella missed a first half field goal, number 43, Cliff Harris, celebrated prematurely. The tactic backfired as Jack Lambert set things straight. Harris was quickly whisked away from danger, but Lambert played the rest of the game with controlled fury. Lambert's play inspired the entire Pittsburgh defense, and for the first time in years, the Super Bowl was truly super. Dallas held its own, but this was an uphill fight against a team built strong in so many ways. A defense of skill and daring. A powerful big back running game. Swarming special teams which contributed a safety to the cause. A poised and polished quarterback and his host of gifted receivers. But above all, a Super Bowl showcase for an artist named Swan. In Super Bowl X, the Pittsburgh Steelers defended their world championship with courage and class. But the best is yet to come. They are young and eager for more. A team with a blueprint and a title. Pittsburgh Steelers ended the 1978 season dreaming of a return to the Super Bowl. But beneath their calm exterior, this was a team troubled by one major concern. Even in their Super Bowl years, Pittsburgh's success had been largely two-dimensional. 
a punishing defense that intimidated opponents into submission, and a ball control ground game that usually scored enough points to win. But Chuck Noll knew that to return to the top, his team would need a third and decisive dimension. And so the 78 Steelers went to the air and they were unstoppable. They powered their way to another divisional title. And then, on January 21st, they returned to the Super Bowl and won. This is the story of the decade's finest football team in its finest hour. The focal point of Pittsburgh's return to glory was quarterback Terry Bradshaw. Always on the periphery of greatness, in 1978, Terry Bradshaw was football's most prolific passer. Shaw's 1978 performance silenced all the critics. He led the American Conference in passing, and he abandoned the reckless style of his youth, running the ball only when there was a safe place for a splashdown. A more mature Bradshaw now steps aside for another look downfield, and his soft pass underneath to Randy Grossman is the perfect complement to the legendary Bradshaw bullet. It was a new look Steeler offense in 78, one that led the entire NFL in touchdown passes. And nobody was more grateful than veteran fullback Frank O'Harris. For six years, Harris was the heart and soul of Pittsburgh's attack, and he had the yardage to prove it. Frank O'Harris is a, kind of a unique back for a big man. He's 6'3", about 235-240 pounds, and he's awfully quick. 10 or 15 carries, he may have 25 or 30 yards, and then boom. But he's a big play man, he makes a lot of big plays. He's never really fit the classic fullback mold, for his style has always been too calculating. Some people call it avoiding contact. Franco calls it picking his hole. In 1978, the light-stepping fullback emerged from the tangle for his 6,000-yard season and became the fifth leading rusher of all time. While Franco provides the finesse, Mr. Mike provides the muscle. Mike Webster is the all-pro center on a line that includes Sam Davis, Ted Peterson, and Jerry Mullen. Ray Penny, Larry Brown, and John Cole. They're pro football's most effective trap-blocking unit. And when Steeler guards open a hole, runners such as Sidney Thornton make the most of it. Even before the football is handed off, Pittsburgh's trap man has eyeballed his target. 
and the result is often a clear path to six points and a show of gratitude to the men with the muscle. And finally, there are the pass catchers, a pair of matching bookends without equal. First, there's Lynn Swan, whose career has been a crash course in survival. But Swan is never intimidated. Last year, he braved the middle for a career-high 61 catches. And as always, he did it with impeccable style. Swan's soft-spoken colleague doesn't have Lynn's flamboyant reputation, but John Stallworth's talent is every bit as spectacular. His hands are surpassed only by his uncanny ability to pick his way through a broken field, for no wide receiver in the game does it better. In 1978, John Stallworth and Lynn Swan were the hitmen of pro football's most explosive strike force, an offense that could beat you in so many ways. Here is Bradshaw giving the ball to Blyer. Blyer reverses it to Swan. He gives it back to Bradshaw. Bradshaw fired for Cunningham. A Pittsburgh touchdown. How about that? A Pittsburgh touchdown to win the ball game. The Pittsburgh Steelers won their first seven games and looked awesome in doing so. Through seven weeks, the Steelers scored more points than any team in football. It was no wonder their leader was optimistic. They just don't believe they're going to lose, and they have a great desire to go back to the Super Bowl. Very hungry bunch of football players, and when you get great, talented men and assemble them together that have a goal in mind that they want to be the world champions again, I don't know what's going to stop them. In week eight, Monday Night Football came to Three Rivers, and so did a rookie sensation named Earl Campbell. Campbell tunneled his way through the steel curtain for three short yardage touchdowns and performed like a champion. The Steelers, meanwhile, played like a team in a trance. Pittsburgh lost their first, and the after-effects lingered. In week nine, Kansas City scored 24 points, but made one fatal mistake. It resulted in Donnie Shell's first pro touchdown and a narrow three-point Steeler win. The following week, Rocky Blyer caught his first ever regular season touchdown pass, but it came with less than two minutes to play as Pittsburgh struggled from behind to beat the Saints. Then in week 11, the faltering Steelers crumbled in the L.A. Coliseum. A crucial rematch with Houston was only three weeks away. There was no need to panic. Nonetheless, it was time to get back to the basics. He looks like Count Dracula in cleats, and nobody's approach to football is more basic than that of all pro middle linebacker Jack Lambert. Getting back to the basics means turning Lambert loose to play his game and breathe fire into those around him. It also means adding some muscle to the pass rush, sending not only the front four, but linebackers and secondary people as well in a punishing array of blitzes.
through the final five weeks of the season, the steel curtain was once again invincible. There simply was no way through L.C. Greenwood, Steve Furness, Joe Green, John Banazak, and Dwight White. No way around Robin Cole, Lauren Taze, Dennis Winston, and all pro Jack Han. And no way over Mel Blunt and Ron Johnson, Donnie Shell, Tony Dungy, and Mike Wagner. In the Astrodome in week 14, the Steel Curtain dug in for a rematch with Earl Campbell and the Oilers. Only this time, the Steelers were playing basic defense. Pittsburgh hammered Earl Campbell into submission, and the NFL's Rookie of the Year spent most of his afternoon on the Oilers' sideline, nursing sore ribs and watching Pittsburgh clinch the Central Division title. Bradshaw to Stallworth produced the game's only six-pointer, but it was enough to ensure Chuck Knoll's team of its seventh straight playoff appearance, an American football conference record. And so, as playoff weather settled over Three Rivers Stadium, the Steelers readied themselves for the Super Bowl chase. This was the deepest Steeler team ever. The air game had quality reserves in Kruchek and Stout, and receivers Jim Smith and Theo Bell. Chasing down Jarilla and Colquitt's kicks were such names as Corson, Delaplain, Anderson, Beasley, Moser, Dunn, and Ola. On the kick return side, rookies Randy Rudisham and number 30, Larry Anderson, gave Pittsburgh a season of outstanding field position, as well as the NFL's second highest kickoff return average. There were new faces on defense too, but the same old result. The 1978 Pittsburgh Steelers scored more points and won more games than any team in Steeler history. And as the regular season drew to a close, they were playing near-perfect football. Terry Bradshaw's Super Bowl prophecy was looking better and better, and the time was drawing near to make it a reality. Coming up, the NFL playoffs. During the week, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania makes the nation steel. But on Sunday, they become the Steeler Nation. Go out and get them Steelers. So the Steelers go in with plenty of offense and lots of defense, and it takes us back to those 74 and 75 teams. Plus, which the Steelers have that terrible towel going for them. Yep, this year we've had a revival of the terrible towel. And this carried the Steelers all the way in 75. It imputes great strength to the Steelers and, if need be, poses mysterious difficulties for the enemy. You'll see thousands upon thousands of terrible towels waving out in those stands today. The terrible towel is poised to strike. So are the Steelers. In the opening round of the playoffs, the Denver Broncos couldn't stop Pittsburgh's dynamic duo. John Stallworth dazzled the Broncos with a playoff record 10 receptions. Lynn Swan caught only two, 
but one of those will go down as one of the great catches in playoff history. The Steeler Nation had win number one. They were halfway to Super Bowl 13. But the second leg of the journey would depend on the defense. The NFL's leading Russia became beef in the stew. The NFL's best protective quarterback was treated rudely, then left to ponder his predicament in a Pittsburgh puddle. The mighty steel curtain did not allow a touchdown. While Houston took a bath, Pittsburgh took the early lead as both Harris and Blyer hydroplaned a first period score. Then, late in the first half, a close game became a laugher as loyal Steeler fans were treated to a scoring blitz. Bradshaw back to throw. He wants to go deep. Hangs it high toward the end zone. Spot is open. Touchdown, Pittsburgh. Looking for the end zone, he fires it down the middle, Stallworth has it, touchdown Steelers! Hey, we got the best offense, the best defense, the best QB, the best running back, the best everything, best coaching staff, the best front office, and we got the terrible time. Terrible time, what more do we need? The Pittsburgh Steelers were going to the Super Bowl. January 21st, 1979. Super Bowl 13. On Pittsburgh's first offensive possession, Terry Bradshaw revealed his game plan to the Dallas Doomsday defense. Bradshaw hesitates and then throws deep for Stallworth in the end zone. Touchdown, Pittsburgh! Johnny Stallworth caught it between two Dallas Cowboys, and the Steelers are on the board first. How about that? John Stallworth caught only three passes in the game, but two went for touchdowns and his 75-yard sprint through traffic tied a Super Bowl record. But the defending Super Bowl champion Cowboys were quick to steal away Pittsburgh's momentum. Minor setbacks, however, did not alter the Steelers' master plan. Bradshaw! 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 Bradshaw hangs it up high. Fire has it a leaping catch in the end zone. Touchdown, Pittsburgh! Pittsburgh took a seven-point lead into period three, but Dallas risked life and limb to get back into the game. Back to throw, wide open. Enzo has dropped it. 
He went to Jackie Smith. And down on the turf, he lost it. Dallas wasted its best opportunity. They settled for a field goal. And Pittsburgh took a four-point lead into the final period where three plays would decide the outcome. Harry Bradshaw. <laughs> Giving the ball to Franco through the middle, then over the 15 to 10, the 5, touchdown Pittsburgh. They opened it up down the middle. He knocked them loose in every direction, and the Steelers go on the board with a TD. There's Jarella scrubbing the kick down short inside the 25, picked up at the 24. Fumble! Ball loose! Still loose! Still fighting for it at the 21. It is the Steelers football. No, it's Dallas's football. Who has got the football? The Pittsburgh Steelers had the football. And now Terry Bradshaw would throw it to a world championship. Dallas Cowboys played their hearts out, but they were a single team against an entire nation. The mighty Pittsburgh Steelers. In the last five years, they have won an unprecedented three Super Bowl titles. Pass the word, pro football. The king is back. Put yourself in this difficult situation. You're a professional football player. Your team is on the road. And your team bus has just arrived outside Pittsburgh's Three River Stadium. There are 27 teams in pro football. And then, there are the Pittsburgh Steelers. Not since the old Green Bay Packers has a pro football team become as well known as the Pittsburgh Steelers. Familiar faces that will make handsome busts in the Hall of Fame. It's a team of great character, men of superior physical strength and superb athletic ability. Men who would give you the shirts off their back. But the architect of this NFL power remains a mystery. Chuck No, a pro football fundamentalist. Basically, we like to pride ourselves on being a very fundamental football team because uh, when it all comes down to things, you don't fool too many people very often. 
you have to uh, you have to win by blocking well and tackling well, out hitting your opponents, and uh, it takes special kinds of people to do that. And those special kinds of people are the ones we're looking for. And I think we have those kinds of people. Special kinds of people, each one homegrown. No member of Chuck Knoll's team has ever played for another NFL club. And each of Knoll's players has the qualities Pittsburgh fans admire. The guts to go over the middle. The moxie to make a statement then back it up. The determination to get the ball away and the teamwork to make it count. There's a closeness on this club not found on most other professional teams. A genuine camaraderie that can't be installed or coached. It's a closeness that involves Pittsburgh's fans as well. Pittsburgh fans are very warm people and they adopt you, they make you one of their own. Uh, Pittsburgh is a close community, it's tight. Um, they, they do get involved with, with this football team. And as I say, they adopted this football team and we all, we belong to them. And just, that's my Pittsburgh Steelers right there. They're really tremendous fans and they, they will not be outdone by any other National Football League city. Like their loyal admirers, the Steeler defense will not be outdone. Each week, the game's brightest offensive stars come to Pittsburgh eager to impress. Each week, the steel curtain makes them humble. The names are well known. Greenwood, White, Banasak, and Beasley. Dunn, Furness, and a 10-time All-Pro named Joe Green. Ham and Cole, Taves and Winston, Valentine and Mr. Lamb. Blunt, Thomas, and Johnson. Woodruff, Wagner, and number 31, Donnie Shell. Three words describe this defense. The first is intense. The second, aggressive. The third, opportunistic. Sustaining a drive against Pittsburgh is like trying to breaststroke through a vat of molten steel. Painfully impossible. Mighty steel cut. From north, south, east, and west they arrive, treating their opponents like stepped on bugs, making them wish they had chosen another profession. Pittsburgh Steelers are a sterling silver testament to building through the college draft. Young men live in the shadows of all pros, waiting for their moment in the sun. When it arrives, Pittsburgh's eager youngsters are ready. 
the rookies always say, well, I have to be tough to get to, to make this ball club. And I think that our teams do play a rough, tough football game. They have always, even in the days when we lost. Somehow, Matt Barr doesn't fit the Steeler mold. Nonetheless, 1979's baby-faced rookie was worth his weight in gold, especially in overtime. A 37-yard attempt. The snap, the ball is down. Barr kicks it. Long enough, high enough. It is good! It is good! Matt Barr kicks it from 27 yards out. 37 yards make it. And the Steelers hoist him up on their shoulders. The ball game is over. In sudden death, Matt Barr kicks a 37-yard field goal. Barr's buddies on Pittsburgh special teams do fit the Steeler mold. Rough, tough, and intimidating. Every NFL coach wants quality reserves. Pittsburgh has them. In players such as Zach Valentine, Tom Graves, Larry Anderson, Tom Dornbrook, and punter Craig Colquitt. Reserves such as quarterbacks Mike Kruchak and Cliff Stout, and running backs Rick Moser, Greg Hawthorne, and number 33, Anthony Anderson. Reserves such as T. Bell and number 86, Jim Smith. It's been suggested that Pittsburgh's second unit could win the Central Division. Pittsburgh's first unit does, due in large part to an offensive line whose short sleeve jerseys leave nothing to the imagination. Mike Webster, Sam Davis, Jerry Mullins, Ted Peterson, John Cole, and Steve Corson. Pro football's most dependable escort service. Follow a Steeler back to the point of attack, and you'll spot a Steeler lineman chopping down defensive timber. Sidney Thornton followed his blocks to a co-starting role. And though he ran the 75-yard dash in less than world-class time, he and Rocky Blyer together combined for 1,019 yards rushing. Nagging injuries hampered the early season performance of Pittsburgh's perennial 1,000-yard rusher, causing a foolish few to write Franco Harris off as over the hill. But in week six, guard Sam Davis zeroed in on a defenseless Cleveland Brown. And downfield, Franco got a block from the rock. The big fullback was on his way to his seventh thousand yard season. Before Franco Harris, the Pittsburgh Steelers never once made the playoffs. With him, they've never missed. Franco Harris, the fourth leading rusher of all time. Franco Harris is vital to Pittsburgh's attack, but quarterback Terry Bradshaw has seen to it that Franco is no longer a force of one. Everybody knows we run Franco, we run Franco, and everybody's trying to stop Franco. And so we just said, fine, you stop Franco, we'll throw the football. When it comes to throwing a football, whether standing still or on the run, nobody does it better than Terry Bradshaw. His targets include tight ends, Benny Cunningham and Randy Grossman. Wide receivers, T. Bell and Jim Smith. But his favorite two receivers are a Barnum and Bailey act in cleats, Lynn Swan and John Stallworth. 
Swan is the high-flying acrobat of daring and grace. Stallworth is the hard-working magician, the Harry Houdini of NFL pass catchers. Together, they are the most dangerous pass-catching tandem in football. In 1979, John Stallworth was Pittsburgh's most valuable player. The leading man in a 45-man cast that played to a record eighth straight playoff appearance. They weren't always perfect, but when those lead pipe arms finally put the ball in play, Pittsburgh outscored every team in football running away with their seventh Central Division title in eight years. They entered the 79 season as Super Bowl champions. Now, it was time to defend that title. Coming up, the NFL playoffs. With Chuck Knoll's team closing in on a fourth Super Bowl appearance, the city saluted its heroes by day and sang their gospel by night. Oh, it's the greatest thing ever. It's done so much for Pittsburgh, for the sports fans. Nationwide notoriety, it's great. See, we're greater than just mill workers. <laughs> There's more than that to Pittsburgh, right? Yeah, right. Offense, offense, take that football all the way up the field. Here go the Pittsburgh Steelers into the National Football League playoffs, going up against the Miami Dolphins. The Steelers out to win their fourth Super Bowl victory. The Steelers coming into the NFL playoffs looking for big number four. The Steelers are so great, and they play the best of all to take our Pittsburgh to the Super Bowl. In the opening round of the playoffs, Pittsburgh's pass catchers ran away from the Miami Dolphins. The Steelers scored touchdowns on their first three possessions to advance to the AFC Championship game. There, they would face the Houston Oilers, a team that had shown a lot of heart in an upset win over San Diego. From watching yesterday, they ain't banged up at all, you know. Uh, fine team, fine team, great attitude. They, they are, they're made, they are made of, of, of outstanding uh, stuff. Well, you know, we still got a lot of respect for them, uh, but, you know, we'd much rather have them in Pittsburgh. We were down there about three weeks ago on Monday night, and you know, it wasn't one of our better nights, but, uh, you know, we got them right where we want them this time, I think. They're a good football team. Uh, they have the capabilities to overcome um, bad things that happen to them, and uh, we're going to have to be ready to play a very tough, physical, mistake-free football game here if we want to we win it. As Bradshaw calls the signals and drops back for the Pittsburgh Steelers. They can't get to him. He fires the pass, intercepted at the 25, back over the 30, the 35, the 40. Here they come. It's Vernon Perry with the ball, the 50, the 40, the 30. He's down to the Pittsburgh 20, the 15, the 10. He's going all the way for a Houston touchdown. Vernon Perry, who was a key man.
Bradshaw with plenty of time. Let's go down the middle there. He is Stallworth for the touchdown. Touchdown, Pittsburgh. Listen to this crowd. Look at those terrible pounds playing, you betcha. As Stallworth leaves Greg Stemmerich. Late in period three with Pittsburgh leading by a touchdown, Oiler receiver Mike Renfro caught a pass in the corner of the end zone. The officials ruled that Renfro was juggling the ball as he crossed the end line. No one will ever know for sure. What is certain is that this close call ignited Pittsburgh's game-winning fourth-quarter drive. Here's Bradshaw firing it to the near side, and there's Blyer to pull it in on a great catch at the 18. First down, Pittsburgh. Come on, let's go! For the fourth time in six years, the Pittsburgh Steelers were going to the Super Bowl. At the Rose Bowl in Pasadena, California, Pittsburgh set out to crush the Los Angeles Rams. The heavily favored Steelers managed only a single touchdown through a difficult and perplexing first half. But if the defending champions were upset with a halftime score, it didn't show in their head coach. For Chuck Noll had yet to fire his big gun. Like two hard-hitting heavyweights, the Steelers and Rams traded knockout punches. But somehow you knew the final round would go to the champions. Now Bradshaw pumping, firing downfield. There goes Stallworth. He pulls it in at the 30, the 20, the 10, the 5. And it's a touchdown for Pittsburgh on the ball to Stallworth. And Stallworth beat Rod Perry. The Steelers oh, once beat. again had the Rams on the floor. And this time, they weren't about to let them back in the fight. And he lets it fly down the middle, and it's intercepted at the 15. And that's Clamber with a football. And Bradshaw lets it fly down the middle, and there goes Stallworth again. And he has it. Does he hold it? He does. Stallworth beats the coverage again and takes it at the 23-yard line. The team of the decade stepped forward to take its rightful place among the greatest teams ever. The Rams punch it up front. Grossman in motion to the left. And on to Harris. Harris slices up the left side for a touchdown. Lights his way over the goal line. Franco Harris slicing off the left side and flips into the end zone for a Steeler touchdown. There are 28 teams in pro football, but only one is a cut above.